well, um, before I uh, begin, I want to make a, a little point about the term uh, big data. Uh, in April 2011, my colleagues and I uh, published a special issue of Historical Methods titled Big Data. This is the Google trend of searches for big data. And uh, there's where our article appeared. I, I never really figured out why we didn't get famous for, uh, for inventing this fad. But at any rate, um, uh, there you are. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, three topics. Um, the United States has lagged behind other developed countries in the use of linked demographic and uh, um, administrative records. And I'm going to explore some of the reasons for this. Uh, in, in particular, uh, I'm going to tell you about the 1965 proposal for a national data center that collapsed in a frenzy of paranoia about the perils of Big Brother. Then I'm going to talk about several uh, 21st century data curation and linkage projects that are effectively attempting to uh, fulfill the vision of the National Data Center uh, and have the potential to provide a new framework for understanding the past. Um, and finally, uh, I'm going to close with a discussion of uh, new paranoid threats to data. Even though the United States has lagged behind Europe in the uh, a development of linked demographic and administrative records, it has been traditionally a leader in providing open access to powerful uh, public use data. Uh, and very soon that data may uh, disappear uh, because of a new frenzy of paranoia. Um, so let me start with the 1965 National Data Center. Um, well, in the United States, uh, we have no uh, organization called Statistics USA. Uh, instead, we have 14 different major national statistical agencies. Here's the 14. Uh, and in addition to these, the federal government has 89 minor statistical agencies. On top of that, vital records are a state responsibility. Uh, uh, this is the state of Utah. I have a birth certificate, a marriage certificate from the state of New York, a death certificate from California. Uh, the content of uh, vital records varies from state to state. Most states charge money to get access to these. Uh, and then when you go to the other records that are commonly linked in, in Europe, education records and health records, it's even more of a mess. There's a mix of public and private uh, and there's no, uh, and there is no centralized database. Um, these are my parents, uh, Richard and Nancy Ruggles, and they worked hard uh, through their careers to overcome these obstacles. And in the late 1950s, they began working on the problem of integrating individual level and aggregate level data to improve national income accounting. And that led them to the Census Bureau where they began uh, analyzing microdata, which is a term that they coined for uh, to refer to individual level data. In 1962, my, my, my dad was appointed chair of the Committee on the Preservation and Use of Economic Data uh, by the uh, Social Science Research Council. And uh, they came up with a report uh, in 1965 that became known as the Ruggles Report. Uh, I should probably include my mother in this picture because she, she probably wrote most of the report, but you know, this being the 1960s, uh, she didn't get any credit. So at any rate, the report noted that there was a lot of uh, uh, data in the federal government, but it was dispersed over many agencies and there were lots of obstacles to using these data and it was absolutely impossible to link them together because uh, each of the agencies was very proprietary and wouldn't let uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you mix it with data from other sources. The report was uh, pretty forward-looking. It recognized the power in specifically of 
microdata, uh, uh, noting that unaggregated micro in, in, uh, information offer uh, greater uh, potential uh, for the tabulations. You got to keep in mind, in this period, microdata was a very new concept uh, in, in, in 1965. There were very few microdata sets available. Um, and uh, they also recognized uh, the importance of old data, that you don't just need the new data, you need the old data uh, 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 as well. So um, they, uh, the report urged the creation of a new federal data center uh, with the, these, these goals to preserve the data, to, to open access to uh, research community, uh, uh, to provide more consistent documentation, consistent data formats, uh, to harmonize data across agencies and provide record linkage so you could link not only uh, across uh, agencies, but also across time to, to build up life histories. And so they submitted the report to the Bureau of the Budget. Uh, uh, and uh, so the Johnson administration appointed two additional committees to figure out the logistics of the proposal. Uh, they, they, everybody agreed it was a great idea. The Johnson administration decided to go full steam ahead and establish the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the new data center. Uh, but uh, then the uh, shit hit the fan. There, there were multiple hearings in both the House and the Senate about the invasion of privacy that would occur if the National Data Center were established. The most vehement critic was this guy, Cornelius Gallagher, uh, a Republican from New Jersey, who chaired the Invasion of Privacy Subcommittee. Uh, uh, he cited the horrendous potential for a computerized and dehumanized version of hell. And then the press picked it up. There were hundreds of articles on the subject. Here's a couple of examples. Here's the Herald Tribune, uh, the, the data center plan called Invasion of Privacy. The Washington Post said uh, it was a harbinger of Big Brother. Uh, the uh, New York Times here, uh, data bank peril or aid, described it as an Orwellian threat to personal privacy. Here's the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, computer as big brother. And, and it was all the major net, net magazines, Look, Atlantic, Newsweek, Forbes, Time, US News and World Report, The New Republic, New Yorker. There were even two separate articles in Playboy. Here's a few of these. This is New York Times Magazine. Uh, uh, bureaucratic efficiency could put us in chains of plastic tape. Look Magazine, which was one of the biggest magazines in the country in the mid-1960s. Will it kill your freedom? Uh, and The Atlantic, uh, a little more highbrow uh, 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 article about the National Data Center and uh, personal privacy. So, so the social scientists tried to defend the idea. They pointed out that data security could be uh, uh, improved with a central system because the way it was going, there was an ad hoc kind of system uh, across all these uh, different agencies, some of which had uh, uh, very little in the way of privacy controls, uh, but uh, no, nobody listened. Uh, the, uh, the Johnson administration quickly backed down uh, and abandoned the idea of the National Data Center. So why was there such a panic? Well, partly it was fear of the computer, the electronic brain, which in science fiction often proved to have malevolent intent. Some of the fears were more realistic. J. Edgar Hoover was director of the FBI and his abuses of power had been coming to light. It was an open secret that the FBI maintained files on millions of Americans that were sometimes used to intimidate and blackmail. Because the FBI was corrupt and political, the entire federal government was suspect. In the wake of the firestorm created by Gallagher and the press, 
the, the data center to simply disappeared. The Ruggles report did have one direct consequence. The National Archives of the uh, uh, established uh, the data archive branch, uh, which is now known as the Machine Readable Data Division, uh, and 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 the 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 government began to preserve electronic records. Um, and in the end, they did kind of get uh, uh, their national data set. And they, they continued to work in the Census Bureau uh, and the Social Security Administration and other agencies to conduct uh, analyses and make data usable. And in the 1970s, they began working on a project to construct a longitudinal file from the annual survey of manufacturers and the census of manufacturers uh, over time to link records for individual uh, firms. and. Uh, to make this data available to researchers, the Census Bureau established uh, what they called a, re a research data center in 1982 to maintain and disseminate the uh, longitudinal establishment database in a secure environment. And that grew into the federal statistical research data centers, which now consists of, uh, uh, includes data from not just the Census Bureau, but from uh, 12 federal agencies, uh, and there are 30 branches around the country. Uh, this is where they're located. Um, so, you know, uh, you could you could argue that this this vision of a national data center is is in a in a sense kind of uh, um, uh, coming to pass, but it's coming to pass more um, uh, because of some large data infrastructure projects. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, this brings me to my next section uh, uh, where, where I'm going to tell you about uh, these new uh, big data developments that are, uh, um, I think, having a transformative impact. Um, so first of all, there's two data collection projects I'm going to talk about, National Historical Census Files Project that's been going since 2002 and is virtually complete. Uh, and then the big microdata project, which started a little bit earlier and will go a little bit longer. Uh, um, and secondly, I'm going to talk about two uh, um, record linkage projects, the Census Longitudinal Infrastructure Project and the multi-generational longitudinal panel. So National Historical Census uh, Project, uh, uh, first up. This is a collaboration of IPMS and the Census Bureau. And the goal was to recover all of the internal census microdata for the period 1960 through 2000. So we scoured the Census Bureau, Bureau uh, found every copy of the data uh, 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 and, and verified that they uh, that they uh, actually match uh, the published tabulations, that all the data was there, uh, converting, then convert them into uh, harmonized IPMS format, write documentation, uh, and stuff like that, and make them available for, through the Federal Statistical Research Data Centers, because of course, they're all, this is all restricted data that's still confidential. Um, and it's a big, big scale. Uh, it was uh, 1.1 billion records, uh, and we would have been, we should have been done by now, but uh, we uh, were just working on the most uh, uh, recent uh, censuses, getting them finally converted into IPMS format. But we will be done shortly. We got slowed down a little bit. The 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 most challenging part of the project was uh, 1960 um, uh, when we. Um, when we went to uh, 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 um, do the 1960 census, we found that every copy of the data that we could find anywhere in the Census Bureau was missing uh, this whole Chicago area. Um, and uh, that that was a problem. Uh, and, um, uh, and so this is a this is a FOSDIC machine. Uh, FOSDIC is the film optical sensing device for input to computers. Uh, and uh, it uh, uh, was the means by which the 1960 census was converted into machine readable form. Uh, and uh, um, at any rate, um, 
it, so it was it, it, it was the first high speed optical mark recognition uh, system that there was in the world. It was actually built at the Census Bureau, uh, um, and uh, uh, it, it used these bubble sheets. Uh, these are just like the ones you'd use for a standardized test. Uh, uh, you fill them out with a number two pencil. Here's the question for, is there a clothes washing machine in this unit, Ringer or Springer, washer dryer combination and so on. Uh, and uh, so uh, the microfilms were, uh, the, the, uh, the bubble sheets were microfilmed and then uh, the uh, Fosdick machine read the microfilm. You can see uh, the operator there is loading some microfilm now. Uh, and um, so the, it seemed to me the key to solving the sh missing Chicago problem was to find the microfilm. And uh, so after some investigation, uh, I located the microfilm frozen on shrink wrapped pallets in this cave in Lenexa, Kansas. Uh, and uh, so it's a big cave, there's the interior. Uh, so we set up a scanning station inside the cave uh, and uh, scanned all the microfilm reels from the Chicago area, got them converted into data, and, uh, mach modern machine readable data, and uh, we uh, uh, merged them into the data sets. So um, uh, 1960 was fixed. Um, the second big project I want to talk about, the big data project, is the big historical microdata project. And this is a collaboration of IPMs with FamilySearch and Ancestry.com, the two largest genealogical companies uh, in the United States. And uh, through this project, uh, we are creating complete microdata for the United States from 1790 to 1950. Uh, we have released all the data now uh, for 1790 to 1940. 1950 won't be released uh, to the public before uh, 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 for another year, April 2022, um, and uh, we will uh, we will process that when when that happens. Uh, but uh, this uh, is a very large scale project, which uh, uh, would would have been very expensive uh, if we did not have the collaboration of the genealogical companies to do the digitization. Um, so this is the situation we are in. The green is the data from the National Historical Census Files Project, the 1.1 billion records that are in the Federal Statistical Research Data Centers. The peach colored uh, 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 bit there is the uh, data that we uh, collaborated with the genealogical companies to uh, uh, digitize for the period 1790 to 1950. Uh, and then the, the blue down there is just the public use data that the Census Bureau has been releasing all the way since uh, 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 for the last uh, 60 years. Okay. So uh, now I'm gonna talk about the two linking projects. Uh, so like the two data projects, the first linking project deals with the recent period, the, the restricted data, and the second one deals with the older data that is in the public uh, domain. So uh, the, the CLIP project, as we call it, is a collaboration of IPMs and the Census Bureau. And the goal is to link records uh, from the censuses from 1940 to 2020, both to each other and to administrative records. Um, and we have completed the linkage of 1940 to 2000 and 2010. Uh, and we have about a dozen research projects underway in the federal statistical research data centers. Uh, and uh, the, the most challenging part of this project is that from 1960 to 1990, the Census Bureau never digitized the names. And so uh, we are working on uh, optical scanning for those. This is what, this is the Fosdick form for 1990. It's a bubble sheet, very much like the form for 1960. Uh, and you can see the names are up here at the top. And so the, 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 the issue is we have to scan those names and interpret them. And uh, the, 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 the work we've done so far is very promising. Uh, and uh, uh, we expect that this this will happen, uh, but it will not happen quickly because you know census is census. 
So the uh, linking strategy for CLIP begins with 1940, uh, and uh, we link 1940 to the Social Security Administration Numident file. The Numident file is the Social Security enrollment database. Uh, and uh, one of the nice things about it is that it includes uh, all the name changes people have over the course of their lives. So it includes uh, maiden names for married women, or indeed, if they have multiple serial marriages, they include uh, all the names that they had at each point of their lifetimes. Uh, and so that makes the record linkage easier. Uh, we also uh, use World War II military records to uh, help us in some cases with uh, identifying people in the Numident. The Numident is already linked to the 2000 and 2010 censuses and, and to all of these other administrative uh, sources. So um, uh, uh, we can, um, uh, you know, it's really an extremely rich uh, uh, database. Uh, so right now we are not doing, we have not done the 1960, 70, 80, or 90 censuses because we don't have the names, uh, but uh, when, then when they get added, it will be, of course, much better. The second linkage project is called the Multigenerational uh, Longitud Longitudinal Panel, or IPAMS MLP. And again, this is to cover the earlier period. Uh, with the public data, it's much easier to work with because it's outside of the, the RDCs. Uh, but um, uh, unfortunately, the data is not good, not as good. But uh, the goal is to link 1850 through 1940 to each other and to other records. We did our first release last summer, and we're about to come out with a new version. And we plan to come out with new versions annually, virtually indefinitely, because you can always improve this sort of thing. So again, our strategy is we start with 1940, but this time we link backwards. We link backwards to the 1850 to 1930 censuses. This only goes back to 1850, not 1790. Uh, and to do that, we use, there's a public version of the Numident that we can use uh, that will help us link women, uh, that does help us link women. And we also have access to some uh, genealogical data that can uh, help with that problem as well. Uh, and uh, then we link to military records, uh, 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 vital records, uh, and most importantly, to CLIP, so that you can actually then bring this MLP into the federal statistical research data centers and have coverage all the way from 1850 up to 2010. So that brings me to my last topic, the revival of paranoia. So in an echo of the paranoid streak that foreclosed the national data center in the 1960s, we now face threats to some of the most intensively used demographic data in the world. Uh, and and the, the Census Bureau, as I mentioned, has been a world leader in providing access to public population data. Uh, in, in 1962, uh, the uh, uh, Census Bureau uh, uh, created the first public use microdata file, uh, and they also created the first uh, small uh, electronic small area file. Uh, uh, the 1962 data was distributed on 13 Univac tapes, or you could get the one in 10,000 version on 18,000 punch cards if you didn't have a tape reader. So uh, at any rate, Last Friday, the uh, Census Bureau uh, uh, at the ACS data users meeting described a plan to replace the American Community Survey uh, uh, microdata, which is the descendant of the 1960 public use sample uh, with fully synthetic data by uh, 2024. This is, this is a bad thing, you know, because the ACS is one of the most intensively used scientific databases in the world. According to Google Scholar last year, uh, there were 12,000 publications based on ACS data. Um, so um, the, the, the synthetic plan, what they do is they develop some statistical models describing the relationship between the variables and the ACS. Uh, and um, then they construct a, a simulated population uh, that's consistent with that. Uh, and and um, obviously, 
you know, uh, you can only you can only uh, look at relationships that they have already baked into the model. So this is not good for studying unanticipated relationships. This kind of impedes new discovery. Um, uh, and and the Census Bureau uh, uh, recognizes you 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 can't do most of the kinds of analyses that people are doing now with the ACS. Uh, it uh, they it only incorporates individual level relationships. So analysis across household members, uh, for example, won't be possible. You can't study ethnic intermarriage or family structure or the impact of a partner's education on fer fertility or something like that. Uh, all, all of those kinds of questions will be foreclosed. So why are they doing this? Well, the motive, the push is coming exclusively from the Census Bureau itself. So in this respect, it's, it's, it's very different from the, uh, the, the big brother paranoia of the 1960s, which was driven by politicians and by uh, uh, the newspapers and ultimately by the public. Uh, nobody cares about it. The, 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 the change is being driven by a radical reinterpretation of census law. This is the chief scientist of the Census Bureau, and he's arguing here that the Census Bureau cannot reveal characteristics even if people's identities are fully protected. So under this vision, microdata has always been illegal, that the Census Bureau has just been blatantly violating the law, according to John, uh, uh, ever since 1962. Uh, um, but there isn't... Um, uh, the risks are in fact very low. Nobody has ever been identified. There's not a single documented case. So it's, uh, uh, you know, it's very difficult to calculate a risk because there's nothing in the, in the numerator. There's no, there's no examples that we have where anyone uh, has been identified. If by some miracle, somebody was identified there wouldn't be very much harm because there isn't very much sensitive information in the American Community Survey. And besides which, um, uh, um, most of the most of the data that is, that's in there could much more easily be obtained uh, from other sources. So if you weigh the profound cost of eliminating the ACS microdata against the fanciful benefits of responding confidenti confidentiality, the Census Bureau just has no justification for closing access to the data. So my conclusions are that the 1965 data center, great idea, but it was foiled by uh, paranoid delusions. It would have increased uh, uh, confidentiality and respondent safety, but uh, uh, there, there was no buy in it. Um, but nevertheless, you know, time passes and uh, the, the current new projects promise to fulfill that vision uh, 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 of the National Data Center. Uh, but the paranoid delusions continue and now threaten, uh, uh, and now they're coming from inside the Census Bureau. Uh, and so I'm going to do everything I can to try and prevent these delusions from destroying the crown jewels of American demographic data infrastructure. Thank you.